All right, so if you can turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Let me pray one more time. Father, we just pray that you would help us now as we look to your word. Help me as I seek to unfold what I believe you put upon my heart. Lord, we love your word. We love you. Pray that you would teach us and apply these truths to us. Encourage those in here who are yours. Strengthen us. Strengthen them. Save those in here who don't know you. Show them Christ and their need of him. Christ, and we ask this. Amen. So we're going to look at the Holy Spirit's work in the believer's life from Galatians chapter 5, where it deals with walking in the Spirit. But before we look at that, I want to give a brief sketch of who the Holy Spirit is before we even look at what he does in our lives when we're walking in the Spirit. There's so much that could be said about who the Holy Spirit is, but I want to focus on just two points. Just two points about who the Holy Spirit is. First, that he is a person, and then second, that he is God. Jesus used masculine pronouns to show that the Spirit is a person. Jesus said about the Spirit that he will teach you all things and he will testify of me. This shows his, 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 his personhood. Um, also, this, the Holy Spirit speaks and can be spoken to, which is a quality of personhood. In Acts 13, 2, the Holy Spirit spoke to the prophets and the teachers that were gathering in the church and told them what they were to do. Two verses later, we see the Spirit sending out Barnabas and Saul. At the end of each letter to the seven churches in Acts 2 and 3, they close with, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Their speaking has to do with personhood. In Acts 5, 3, Peter confronted Ananias and, and said that he had lied to the Holy Spirit. Lying is a form of communication that you can only do to another person. Only a person can be grieved. The very thing that we're told not to do to the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And then also the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not another name for God. The Spirit is a distinct person from the Father and the Son, and he has a distinct personal existence from the Father and the Son. The Spirit being God was made clear when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Spirit. In Acts 5, 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Then in the next verse, Peter said, you have not lied to men, but to God. And the only way we can take that is that, that Peter was saying that the Holy Spirit, who Ananias was lying to, was God. There is no other way that we can take that. The Holy Spirit is God. There is the omnipresence of God, which is a, a doctrine that teaches that God is everywhere at all times. He is not constricted to any certain time or place. And the Spirit shares this attribute of omnipresence. Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? Jesus said about the spirit that he would take his place in the work of the church. And we can think about that. The Holy Spirit taking Jesus' place. Who can take Jesus' place but someone who is like unto him? Someone who is God. In John 14, 16, Jesus said, I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Another helper means that Jesus was the first helper. And another helper is coming who is like him, and the Holy Spirit is a second helper. In John 16, 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So the Holy Spirit continues the work that Jesus began in the church. Octavius Winslow said about the Spirit, Because of his union with the Godhead, we ascribe to him divinity. And because of his personal properties and acts, we, we ascribe to him personality. So there we have the divinity and the personality of the Holy Spirit. He is a person, and he is God. And the Spirit continues to do this work in the church that he began to do when Jesus ascended to the Father. The Spirit continues to work in the church. There's many different ways we can look at this, but I just want to look at one of the ways that the Spirit of God works in the church, what we call walking in the Spirit, and that's directly from, from the text. So here in Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 16 through 25, starting in verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I want us to focus on four phrases in this text. The first one is going to be there in Galatians 5.16. It's, it's the one we're primarily looking at. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So first we have walk in the Spirit. Then in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So there's led by the Spirit. Then verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and then verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So these phrases have to do with how the Holy Spirit works in our lives as Christians, how he works in the church. The issue with this is that there are many people who don't really understand what this means. They don't really understand what it means to be led by the Spirit or, or to walk in the Spirit. They'll, they'll say things like, like, I was led by the Spirit to do such and such. Or that man walks in the Spirit so much that he has direct access to God. Well, using these terms in that way sounds spiritual, but it doesn't really help us to understand what these terms actually mean. These terms are spiritual, but they are not mystical. They are, they are actually understandable. They're spiritual because they deal with spiritual realities. But that doesn't mean that we can't understand them. We can understand them. This text that we're looking at actually tells us what it is when someone is walking in the Spirit it can be seen, it can actually be understood what that looks like when someone is led by the Spirit. We can understand that. So the first passage we're looking at, or the first phrase is there in Galatians 5.16, I say then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. First of all, we see that walking in the Spirit is contrasted with fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So if we're walking in the Spirit, we won't be fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And if we're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, we're not going to be walking in the Spirit. These two are, are contrary to each other. And we see that in the very next verse, in verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So we're actually being hindered from doing what we wish to do. What is it we're being hindered from doing? Are we being hindered from fulfilling the lust of the flesh, or are we being hindered from walking in the Spirit? Which one is it? Well, I'd say it's actually both of these. The Christian is actually being hindered in walking in the Spirit, and the Christian is also being hindered from fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Both of these realities, the flesh and the Spirit, are both at work in the life of the Christian. So the Christian can't complain that he is, or he can't complain that, or he can't claim that he never sins because he has a flesh. And at the same time, the Christian can't claim that he is a carnal Christian because he has a spirit. Both of these realities are at work in the believer all the time. We can think, well, if we want to walk in the spirit, do you want to walk in the spirit as a believer? How can we walk in the spirit? Well, I, I would say this, if you want to walk in the spirit, this is one thing that you need to do. You need to avoid and resist the temptation to practice or participate in any one of these sins that are listed here in verse, starting in verse 19. Look with me at verse 19. Let's go through these. If you want to walk in the Spirit, avoid the temptation to participate in any of these sins. It says there, now the works of the flesh are evident. Again, this is not mystical. This is not something that we can't understand. This is clear and obvious that we're looking at today, walking in the Spirit. The opposite of that, the works of the flesh are evident, it says, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like. 
And the like means that, that we can go on, but we don't need to. We get the point. We could even add whatever struggles we have, add whatever sins that we struggle with to that list. And we need to mark it and avoid it. Well, that's, that's one way we can walk in the Spirit. Let's look at the next phrase there in verse 18. It says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So let's first consider the law. Those, under, those who are led by the Spirit are those who are not under the law. Those who are under the law would be those who are not saved. Those who are under the law are those who are not born again. They're not, they're not believers. They're still in their sins. Galatians 3.10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are, un, are under the curse. There is no promise of salvation for those who are trying to be accepted by God according to keeping his laws. To, to try to keep God's laws in order to obtain a, 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 acceptance by God is to be under God's curse. Salvation is only through trusting in Jesus Christ, that he died for you on the cross, that he rose on the third day. Law keeping looks to self rather than looks to Jesus Christ. We're to look to Christ. The Christian is said, he does not look to, to self, he looks to Christ, but it also says about the law that the Christian is dead to the law. In Romans 7, 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Galatians 2, 19 says, For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. So dying to the law is necessary in order for us to live to God. But this begs the question, what is wrong with the law in order for the Christian, in order for the person to have to have died to it in order to live to God? What, what's wrong with the law? Well, we know that the law is not sin. Romans 7, 7 says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. And Romans 7, 12 says the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So the law is not sin. It's holy, just and, and good. But the effect of the law regarding obtaining righteousness according to it is that it makes us guilty before God. The law causes all to stand guilty before God. Romans 3, 19 and 20 says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law is necessary. It is good, it is holy, and it is necessary to call evil, evil, to show evil for the evil that it is, because we need that. People will justify their evil. They'll call evil good and good evil. People don't know what, what evil is, and, and you know we don't know what good is, apart from God's law, apart from the truth we see in God's word. So the law shows us that we are guilty. It stops every mouth and causes the world to become guilty before God. And because God's law is his law, God's law is perfect as God is perfect, and, and we're not. So that means all mankind is condemned under the law of God, no matter how good we are, no matter how righteous we are, no matter how much we're better from that other person, all the law condemns us because we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of God's glory. So the purpose of the law is not to make anyone righteous. It's not to for us to look at and try to achieve righteousness by keeping it. Only Jesus Christ makes us righteous. The law brings about our condemnation. But there are different perspectives about the law. There are different viewpoints of the law, different ways we can, we can look at the law and the scriptures. Some say that the law is the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. There is the law of Moses as seen in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. The Old Testament is viewed as the law of dispens or the dispensation of law. Law is also seen as a principle, as in the law of sin and death. There's the law of Christ, which probably has to do with what Jesus said in Mark 12, to love God and to love your neighbor. And then there's the law of the Spirit. So there are different, different viewpoints on the law, and then the question would be, well, what do you mean by law according to your viewpoint? The law can also be viewed as being synonymous with statutes or commandments, um, if you want to follow with me, I'm going to read Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. And here we'll see that the, the law can be viewed as another term for God's statutes, God's commandments, everything that God has revealed to us within his holy word from Genesis to Revelation. So Psalm 19, starting in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then there in verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So we have here law, testimony, statutes, commandment, and judgments. And I don't believe that we can individualize these into five different categories. All of these terms are actually interchangeable with one another. We can say that this passage here is referring to God's law, or we can say it's referring to God's statutes or God's judgments. And I believe it would, it would all mean the same thing. So we can also view the law in this context, that the genuine believer who is saved by Jesus Christ apart from the law can view God's law as all of his revealed truth in his holy word from Genesis to, Revel to Revelation. And he, can, and he can view it in, in that context. A Christian can echo what, what is said in Psalm 119, verse 34. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. So we have no quarrel with the law. We recognize that the law has no power to cause us or enable us to keep it, to do what it says. Again, there are different ways that we can, we can view the law. So we don't want to make strict or rigid definitions of our viewpoint, viewpoint on the law um, because it can cause unnecessary division in the body of Christ. And we don't want to do that. And I hope I didn't do that now in, in seeking to understand the law according to what we have here in our text. So according to Galatians 5.18, those who are led by the Spirit are not under the weight of the law to keep all of its commands because law says we must be perfect as God is perfect. As I said, it's God's law. So it's perfect as he is, and we are not. So we cannot keep the law. The Christian is not under the law. He is now led by the Spirit. So led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit isn't used in the same way that walking in the Spirit is used. We're called to walk in the Spirit. We're not called to be led by the Spirit. We're told that we are led by the Spirit. The Christian isn't led by the Spirit sometimes and not led by the Spirit at other times. If you're led by the Spirit today, you're going to be led by the Spirit tomorrow, and you'll be led by the Spirit the next day, and every other day after that until you're with Christ in glory. And we see that because of what being led by the Spirit is contrasted with. It's being contrasted with being under the law. So as long as the Christian is not under the law, the Christian is led by the Spirit. We don't go back and forth with being under the law, and we don't go back and forth with being led by the Spirit. We remain not under the law, and we remain as those who are led by the Spirit. This same term, led by the Spirit, is also in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, and it's used the same way. That one says, for as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. The same exact way. So being led by the Spirit is a, a continuous identification of the Christian. He is always the Son of God, and he is always led by the Spirit. And sons of God isn't used to isolate women from this. It's used to emphasize that the inheritance went to the Son. And all those in Christ, whether man, woman, or child, get the inheritance. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Being a son of God means all of the privileges and blessings of God are yours, including God himself. God is yours. So there in both Romans 8.14 and Galatians 5.18, led by the Spirit is not something we are told to do. We are told to walk in the Spirit. We are not told to be led by the Spirit. We are told that we are led by the Spirit. So this has to do with our identity. The identity of the believer. You can think about your driver's license. Your driver's license has on there your name, your birth date, where you live. And imagine that on there, there was a, another category that said spiritual condition. Well, if your spiritual condition was being under the law, that can change because you can be born again. You can be saved and turn, turn to the Lord and be saved and no longer be under the law. But if your spiritual condition is that you're led by the Spirit, that category cannot change. You can change your name. You can change where you live and, and change your identification in that way. But you can't change your spiritual condition of being led by the Spirit. That identification is permanent. It's similar to being called a saint. The Christian is always called a saint. And also the Christian is always led by the Spirit. 
So what is meant by the word led? Well, we know what the word led means. In Proverbs 4.11, it says, I have led you in right paths. And in Ephesians 4.8, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. We understand what it is to be led. We are passive, and the one who is doing the leading is active. We can be led by the Lord. We can be led by the Spirit. The Israelites were led by the cloud. Paul was led by the hand to Damascus because he could not see. Barnabas was led astray through Peter's hypocrisy. We know what the word led means, and we are led by the Spirit. So I'll ask you, are you led by the Spirit? Can you say, I believe by God's grace, I am? Can you say that? But you can think, well, I thought led by the Spirit meant that it, would, it only had to do with an identity of the believer. Well, also, I believe that our, how we live should match with our, our identity. Or at least we should be heading in that direction as believers. We should be heading in the direction to where our lifestyle should look like what God calls us that we are. We should look like we're led by the Spirit in how we live. What does it mean or what does it look like to be led by the Spirit? Well, the third phrase will help us in that. Look at uh, verse 22, the third phrase, the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So against such there is no, no law, meaning if you're living according to the fruit of the Spirit here, these nine parts or these nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, the law is not against you. You're no longer under the law. You're no longer under the law. Now you're in the Spirit. So this is, this is it. This is what it is to walk in the Spirit, is to be living according to the fruit of the Spirit, to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Again, this is not mystical. This is not hidden. This is not something that, that we hear about, but we just can't place our finger on it. it it's not something just for the hyper-spiritual or the, the few spiritual people in the church. All believers are led by the Spirit, and all believers are called, and should be, with God's help, to walk in the Spirit. It's not mystical. But in his book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer tells of the Quaker, Hannah Whitehall Smith, she wrote of a woman who each morning, having consecrated the day to the Lord, as soon as she woke, would then ask him whether she was to get up or not, and would not stir till the voice told her to dress. As she put on each article, she asked the Lord whether she was to put it on. And very often the Lord would tell her to put, it, to put on the right shoe or, and leave off the other. Sometimes she was to put on both stockings and no shoes, and sometimes both shoes and no stockings. It was the same with, with all the articles of her dress. And that's spiritual mysticism, but that is not walking in the Spirit. God doesn't play spiritual jokes with his people to see if they're going to really do what he says or not. In charismatic extremes, there have been people who would take the microphone and howl into the microphone, and, and they say that they did that because the Spirit told them to do that. Again, that's nonsense. That's not what God does in call, calling us to walk in the Spirit. We have exactly what walking in the Spirit is right here in our text, here in Galatians 5. We know what it looks like to be led by the Spirit according to our text, according to the Scriptures. It's to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. We don't have time to look at each individual part or attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, but take a look at that, and, and you can see that's what it looks like to be walking in the Spirit. And again, looking at the works of the flesh, look at that list, and that's not what it is to be walking in the Spirit. So we know that it has to do with bearing the fruit of the Spirit. We know that it has to do with avoiding the works of the flesh, but it has nothing to do with whether you believe the Spirit told you to put on one shoe or, or one, one, one sock rather than both pairs of socks. That, that's nonsense. It's, it, it's clear in the Scriptures what it looks like to be walking in the Spirit. Well, let's look at the fourth phrase there in verse 25. It says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Here again, the Spirit is used... Living in the Spirit is used in the same way as being led by the Spirit. As all Christians are called, are, are said to be led by the Spirit, all Christians are said to be living in the Spirit. In verse 25 there, who is God speaking to? Who is he talking to? We know for sure he is not talking to the world. God is not talking to the world when, when he says this. 
if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You can look at the world and you can see how wicked the world is. You can look at Hollywood and see the talk of Hollywood. You can look at sports and see the, the talk of sports. You can probably even look at your, your own job and see how wicked these environments are. But it is not in those environments that God is saying to walk in the Spirit. It's not. It is to those who live in the Spirit that God is saying to walk in the Spirit. You who, walk, you who live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. God is telling that to Christians. God is, telling that, is, is saying, walk in the Spirit to those who already live in it. And if we think of that in that context, it doesn't sound so impossible. It sounds to where I can say, well, I guess I can actually walk in the Spirit. I can actually do what God is telling me to do because God tells me I live in the Spirit. It's something that's achievable for the believer. Christian, you can walk in the Spirit. Christian, you can avoid fulfilling the lust of the flesh. That doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean it's not hard. But you can because you live in the Spirit because you're led by the Spirit. Now, of course, there are degrees to this. Don't put, don't, don't put so much difficulty upon, upon yourself to where it just sounds impossible. Walking in the Spirit can, can be incremental in its growth. It can, it can be small in its growth. It doesn't have to be dramatic overnight. But o- obeying God's command to walk in the Spirit is possible. You can look at a couple of the of the lust of the flesh, and you can look at a couple of the, the parts of the fruit of the Spirit, and you can say, well, I'm going to work on that right there. And with God's help, you can, and, and, and you can see growth. Again, like I said, not, it doesn't need to be something too overwhelming to where it's too difficult for you as a believer. But if it's small growth, you know what? I'll take it. If it's a little bit better than I am now, I'll take it. And that's the way it is sometimes for us as Christians. There is growth, but sometimes it's a lot smaller. Well, I guess all the time it's a lot smaller than what we wish for. But there is growth. There will be growth. And according to God's word, we can look at his word. And by the help of his spirit, we can grow according to his word. This isn't achieved by mere willpower, though. We're not called to walk in the spirit according to our flesh. We're not, a call, we're not called to walk in the Spirit according to our own grit, or our own religiosity. That's all according to our own flesh. We need to walk in the Spirit with, a, with an attitude of humble dependence upon God. And I say humble because uh, humble, many, in many ways, is the opposite of pride. Humility doesn't look to self. Humility looks outside of self. Sometimes it can be viewed in humiliation. It's forced to look outside of self. But if we willfully humble ourselves, we're willfully looking outside of ourselves and not looking to the law and how I, how I can achieve it or do it, but looking to Christ, looking to Christ for help in obeying him and walking with him and walking in the spirit. So it's humble dependence upon God. We must have an attitude of dependence. And you know if you have an attitude of dependence or not by what comes out of your mouth. You can almost look at what comes out of your mouth. How do you talk? Do you talk as someone who's just dependent upon self, dependent upon others, dependent upon the world, or dependent upon God? So we must have that dependence upon God. And also we can look at our own thoughts. Do we depend upon self or do we depend upon the Spirit of God? Is it that we're relying upon our flesh or we're relying upon the Spirit? So if we're going to have any success in this, it is only going to be because you have a spiritual power to do this. In Romans 8.13, we see that it says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. By the Spirit. So we're doing it. We're putting to death the deeds of the body, but we're not doing it according to our own works. We're doing it by the Spirit. We must put to death the deeds of the body, but we must do it by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for this teaching. Lord, please help us. Help us to understand what's being said in this text. Lord, we don't want it to be mystical. We don't want to use your word in a way to where it sounds good, but there is no understanding in our minds. So please give us that understanding in Christ's name. Amen.